recorded. Therefore, please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made and broadcast by Boston City TV, which is a part of the City of Boston Cable Office of Cable Communications. And now I hand it over to Carl. Evening, everyone. Welcome to the meeting, uh, the Boston Disability Commission meeting for the month of October. I'd like to start with um, just some rules of communication. When you want to speak, raise your hand, and um, Jerry will let me know you want to speak, and I will call on you and then state your name just for the purposes of communication access for everybody in the room. Next, we will all introduce ourselves. I'm Carl Richardson. I am the acting chair, and I am from Brighton, Massachusetts. And to my left, far left. I'm Elizabeth Dean Clower uh, from Back Bay, a uh, commission member. I'm Yardley Sanchez from Dorchester, commission member. Paul Karen, Boston, Mass, commission member. This is Juan Ramirez from Boston, Massachusetts, also a commission member. Um, Olivia Richard, um, I am from Brighton and I am a commission member. Hello, my name is Wesley Ireland. I'm speaking through a sign language interpreter and I'm from uh, the North End. Ducia Lubovskaya, and I live in Boston, Mission Hill specifically, and I'm a commission member. Jerry Boyd from West Roxbury, commission member. And to my left. Hi, I'm Krista McCosh, the disability commissioner for the city of Boston. And on the phone. Hi, this is Felicia Battles Birdsong, Dorchester, commission member. This is Zariami Hosseini. Boston Commission member. Great. Did I get everybody? Okay. Next is the um, approval of the September minutes. I, Jessica sent those out uh, earlier this week. Has everybody had a chance to read them? And do I hear any motions? I move to approve. Any seconds? Second. All those in favor signify, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The ayes carry it, minutes are approved. Thank you, everybody. Next, we have a department presentation on uh, tactical, tactical, I'm sorry, um, technical plazas and public space realm spaces given by um, Jacob Wessel. Thank you, uh, commissioners. My name is Jacob Wessel. I am uh, the newly appointed public realm director in the streets cabinet, uh, reporting to the, the chief of streets, Chris Osgood. Um, I'm here to present uh, on a document that we have been working on with an interagency public realm uh, working group uh, that's titled uh, the Tactical Public Realm Guidelines that uh, should sit in front of you. Um, a reason for why we created uh, this document and uh, the position that I now hold is uh, we've experienced over uh, quite some time a, a lot of difficulty with uh, interventions in how our streets are designed that are temporary and uh, better in, in nature design-wise as we've seen in other cities. So we wanted to be able to have a dedicated strategy and a set of guidelines for us to try things out using more temporary materials, um, things like paint and flex posts, uh, which I'll explain in a bit, um, barriers that can be moved that can uh, we can then learn from physical interventions in city streets uh, so that we can then eventually plan things like concrete curbs, granite set in stone that doesn't really get changed uh, except every few decades. So um, if you have the document in front of you, if you want to turn to page six, 
Um, there is a diagram of a tactical plaza. Uh, we have one tactical plaza currently installed in the city. It is uh, on Franklin Street at Arch Street in Downtown Crossing. That's uh, just a few blocks from here. Uh, it's a, a quite large plaza that uh, repurpose, what these plazas are, are aiming to do is repurpose excess roadway space, that's the asphalt that's typically used by uh, motor vehicles, to reclaim some of that space for people to use um, for uses that are non-vehicular. So uh, at the particular plaza that we've installed, which is indicative of the type of materials that we'll be using uh, down the road, it is, the asphalt has been painted uh, bright green uh, with a variety of different um, accents to it uh, to take sort of a mural form. And uh, separating the, the pedestrian area from the rest of the asphalt, uh, or from the motor vehicles, are both a, a line of temporary plastic curb and also much larger uh, planters that are about four feet in diameter and four feet in height, uh, in addition to then plantings uh, growing out of those planters. Uh, at this diagram that you see in front of you is uh, sort of a, a schematic of what those plazas could look like, and, and this interagency working group, which included uh, staff from the Disability Commission, but also folks from the Public Works Department, Transportation Department, Arts and Culture Department, Boston Planning and Development Agency, uh, and a variety of other groups, all came together to find what our, our minimum requirements would be and things that we would need to most easily approve these types of interventions. So uh, we have within the plaza space itself, there are movable, movable tables and chairs uh, with umbrellas. There are, uh, at the, the Franklin Street Plaza, there are two temporary uh, curbs that were built uh, using asphalt to enable uh, access for those who use mobility devices, mobility assistive devices. Um, and uh, there are also uh, planters interspersed throughout the plaza. Uh, this is all work that we are aiming to do. Uh, in, in addition to this plaza work, uh, we also want to do much smaller interventions uh, utilizing parklets, which are taking over a parking space, uh, one or two parking spaces, and uh, allowing for people to use those spaces instead of uh, mo where motor vehicles would typically be. We currently have three that have been deployed uh, throughout the city of Boston. It, it all started with a pilot program in 2013. Uh, those spaces are uh, fully accessible uh, and flush with the curb. Um, there is some movable seating in some of them and some uh, benched seating uh, in others that uh, is not movable. Uh, the entire uh, purpose of these uh, interventions and some other temporary events that we've held, like uh, when we closed off motor vehicles to Newberry Street or um, uh, Canal Street in the West End is to help Bostonians reimagine public space on city sidewalks and streets uh, to think about other potential uses and uh, get feedback. They could, we've heard plenty of positive feedback, plenty of negative feedback, um, but we want to be able to try these things out and uh, be sure that we can get that good feedback and we can, for most of these types of things, it's always uh, something we can change quite cheaply uh, as compared to the typical capital construction processes. With that, I, I don't know, uh, I, I'm open to questions or if any uh, feedback, and I would also encourage folks if you want to, uh, over time, explore the current uh, plaza that's out there or the parklets that are out there, and I'm happy to just always be, be available as a staffer to receive uh, your uh, constructive criticism. So, Jacob, this is Carl. 
I have two questions based on your um, presentation. One, you said at the larger um, tactical plaza, you install them temporary ramps. Does that also include tactile warning strip for those who are visually impaired? Yes. The um, so there's an asphalt curb ramp with a yellow uh, tactile uh, pad that you would typically see at a uh, you know a, a curb cut. And uh, and how are you with the parklet? <coughs> Got a plus with the curb. How are you letting people know that um, visually impaired folks know that they're walking into a different area? Um, I, as, as someone who didn't uh, develop these guidelines, we're open to your help um, to figuring out the best way for us to indicate uh, to folks how, how we can best alert them of that. Okay, that's just something to consider. And, and there, and there, and Sarah, I'm so Sarah here from the commission staff uh, may know that um, better than I. Okay. Anybody else on the commission have any questions for um, Jacob? Sarah Leung, um, Disabilities Commission. Um, so Carl, we met with the working group, and for best practices, we've encouraged. Um, the proponents of these parklets to install um, planters so they're keen detectable, um, but it would be flush with the sidewalk so there would be no um, tripping hazard when going from the sidewalk to the parklet. Right, but I, I, um, that, that answers part of my question, but how do they know to, if they're on a sidewalk, and let's say the businesses are on the left, mm -hmm. so I'm walking, and the parklet's on my right. How do I know, wait a minute, there's something there, and not a parking spot. So that, so maybe a tactile indication or something. Um, otherwise, I'm not gonna even notice anything there. That's mm -hmm. number one and two. You, you need to know where the delineation starts and ends too. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm just thinking, do you know what I mean? Yes, um, we actually, we asked that question of the Mass Commission um, for the Blind and our consultant there advised us not to use tactile um, strips unless it is a pathway out onto the street and in this situation it wasn't, so she advised against it. Okay. Any other questions from anybody else? Uh, Jerry, Jerry has a question. Go ahead. Um, yeah, Jacob. Just a real simple uh, question: um, the photos in the in the guide in the um, in the guide f under the tactile plaza. I assume are those is, those are of the Franklin uh, Street uh, Plaza at, at, at present. Yeah, uh, with the green base there. Yeah, yeah. That yes, that is the Franklin Street Plaza. Okay. I don't work too far from there, so I'll. I'll be happy to go check it out and give you some feedback. Great, thank you very much. Olivia has a question. Olivia? Hi, this is Olivia. Um, I have a question. Uh, I've noticed on page 11 you have the breakdown for responsibilities between the plaza partner and the city. Um, I noticed bullet point number one under the city says the city is responsible for maintaining the temporary curb. My question is, does that also include the temporary ADA ramps? Yes. So the, I, I think that is that entire phrase is, is referring to the um, ADA ramp itself. So we are responsible for uh, maintaining that. Uh, that is not something that we will be uh, passing on to any of our maintenance partners. Uh, as, as it says, m most of the the day-to-day -day maintenance type things are for um, uh, movable chairs and things like that, but the hard infrastructure of the city will be taking responsibility for. Awesome. Anybody else on the commission have any questions for Jacob? Go ahead. Um, hi, Jacob. This is Ducia. Uh, I was looking at the picture that I see here in the book, and I have to say, unfortunately, I'm not really sure where this plaza is, but it does resemble the so-called the so -called plaza we have near in the downtown crossing district, like where Macy's is and Primark and other stores. 
it does it does resemble that place. And I think my I'm looking at this picture and I'm curious. Uh, first of all, uh, did you say that the tables can be moved? Like if uh, there are some people in wheelchairs, they need more space, so it can be like moved a little further, so there are enough space like for two people in wheelchairs, for instance. Correct. So the the tables as they are now, um, and as we intend to be in all of these plazas, uh, some of which will not be the exact same shape and, and size as the one that's currently out there, um, and they'll be uh, distributed throughout different neighborhoods where we can find excess space. Um, the, an entire point is that, that we're not actually fastening tables to the ground uh, or chairs to the ground. So uh, all four of the chairs are movable, um, and uh, the, the table is movable as well. Good, and the second question I have, and this maybe already was addressed, I do see here like pictures of cars, but is there a place where you can like park, like if someone is arriving using the ride, or how they can get to this location? Is there a parking place uh, nearby, public transportation nearby? I'm just not sure. As I said, I'm not really sure where this is. Yeah, um, so I'll speak first to the, the first plaza we have, and then more generally. Um, so this first plaza is, is right next to the downtown crossing MBTA uh, stop, so it's about one block south of Washington Street. Uh, if you're, it's about two blocks from where the Primark is, and so um, the street itself, um, more generally for all of these plazas, um, will function uh, and, and from a regulatory standpoint, just like any other street. So um, the parking regulations are uh, the same if there's requests for uh, you know, a pickup drop-off zone, if there's a request for certain types of parking regulations for those with handicap placards, um, those will all be considered just as they are now. Um, so this was a three-lane, one-way road that turned into a sort of dead end with, with one lane. So we, we just sort of reduced the carrying capacity of the road that was way uh, underutilized. There's still uh, space currently. Most of the parking on the other side of the this curb is loading area, so uh, that is where the ride would pick up or drop off. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll go ahead, Elizabeth. Elizabeth Dean Clower. Um, this is just a general question. Um, does the, does the, so the furniture just stays out 24-7 uh, in good weather? Uh, the furniture stays out. Um, this plaza is being maintained and, uh, or I'm sorry, is being managed by the Downtown Business Improvement District. Mm -hmm. So they do lock up the um, furniture yeah. at night, I believe. Um, but it but it does stay out there, but it is not usable in the middle of the night. That that is something we'll work on a case by case basis. Um, we would like to have these be accessible as many hours of the day and for as long into uh, whatever season that people deem it appropriate to uh, stay outside as possible. So yes. Yeah, I was curious about that though. Of um, was there a concern about whether the furniture. Um, could be stolen or whatever. Okay. Yeah, so that uh, a key component of this is we'll always want to have an external partner from a uh, neighboring business, a Main Streets district, the Business Improvement District downtown that would look after this furniture um, and hopefully it won't go missing. Yeah, well also just uh, as we've seen with recent weather that, um, you know, in case the if something was unusually, even if it's not snow, but unusually windy or rainy, um, you know, could that could anything become a, a hazard? These uh, the furniture that was selected here is is pretty heavy to, um, so I don't think it would blow over. Um, but it, thank you for that consideration. Is definitely something we're keeping in mind as we figure out what type of furniture to procure. Any other questions? Go ahead. 
Hi, it's Jerry Boyd, Jacob, again. Um, so how long has the, has the current uh, TACTA Plaza been, been up and how long is it gonna stay up and what's the feedback been so far? Uh, thanks for the question. The plaza's been up since this summer. I, I'm sorry, I'm not recalling the exact date, but uh, it's not too old. Uh, it was sort of launched in the summer, so we've had it for a few months now. Um, the feedback has been, uh, the ultimate goal, um, and, and the reason this was considered, um, this street has sort of always been identified as a, a place where uh, there was more roadway space than needed, and actually historically, uh, when I say historically, like 150 years ago, there was actually a, um, uh, like a median park with trees on it um, long ago, uh, when the downtown area of the city was first planned. Um, we intend to have this at least for two years, um, with the potential uh, working with some developers to uh, then try to create a more permanent version of it um, if it works well. Our reception so far has been pretty positive. We, you, you know, at the lunch hour, we see folks out there using it. Sometimes there's uh, the downtown crossing, uh, like t tuba or brass band goes out there and, right. and uh, performs for folks. So uh, we like what we're seeing so far and uh, it's sort of adding to the downtown crossing uh, zone there and extending it a bit further south. Great. Anybody else? Okay. Okay, go ahead. Hi, right, it's Yardley. Have we looked at data from other cities that have implemented these public spaces and, um, and so have, they, have you received it? Have you looked at the feedback from the disability community in those cities specifically and, the, and how they've taken it and how they adjusted to those spaces? Yep. Um, uh, so we have seen, uh, we did not invent this idea. It's been utilized uh, in a bunch of other cities uh, that are uh, utilizing tactical urbanism and this type of uh, temporary public space intervention to uh, enhance uh, public space for a relatively low uh, amount of money. The best examples are New York City has uh, at least three do two to three dozen of these plazas uh, in every borough now. So we've uh, they have seen that there are a variety of different uses for the plazas, most of them are in commercial areas, so they're located near uh, businesses. We are trying to locate them at the very outset near food establishments, near places where there's high pedestrian traffic. But, uh, so that's an example, but there are other examples in cities across the U.S. and internationally where folks uh, have really enjoyed these. I think what will be different from the downtown crossing plaza when we, when as I'm working over the next year to find additional plaza locations is uh, the development and construction of uh, and design of these plazas will be a bit more community driven. Uh, you know, downtown crossing is, uh, you know, an area with lots of office workers and things like that, but as we move into m more mixed use and residential areas, um, we hope to, you know, as we do the painting on the asphalt, can, can we get a local artist in there? Can we work with uh, groups of young people to help design it? And uh, could it be an emblem, something to be proud of for that neighborhood? That's something to point to as to whatever um, neighborhood vibe that the people who often will come to us with the request for that location will help us design. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Jacob, for your explanations. Uh, I just have one um, quick question. Uh, any person with a disability, or any person for that matter, um, if they want to provide some kind of feedback, uh, what would be the best way for them to communicate those ideas uh, to your group? Uh, I don't know, maybe like, or maybe there is like an online platform, like a Twitter account or something like that, where they can just provide their feedback. 
Yes, thank you. Um, so, variety of my my email is uh, similar to other city emails. So it's my first name dot my last name at boston dot gov. Uh, any comments submitted to three one one will be routed to me. Uh, we will be launching a website that is uh, has application processes. Uh, for all of these interventions in the coming weeks. So uh, our feedback information will be listed there as well. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you, Jacob. Thank you so much, appreciate it. <clears throat> Next is the interim chair's report, and it's gonna be very brief tonight because I don't really have much to um, report other than that we have an election in two weeks and I think it's important for people with disabilities to get out there and vote um, make sure we have a voice and also all the polling stations in the city of Boston should be fully accessible wheelchair accessible they should also have a accessible voting machines for the blind and visually impaired and people with hidden disabilities so please get out there and vote for those who are watching us on TV tonight okay thank you Next is Commissioner McCosh's report. Thank you, Carl. Uh, to begin, I would like to just go over a few logistical points for the board. Um, you've all expressed interest in a social event to try to get to know each other a little bit better because we have a lot of new recent appointees. So I'd like to suggest that we, uh, we only have one meeting left this year. It's on December 12th. That's gonna be a combination of our November and December meetings. So I'd like to suggest in our social holiday party um, on that night, either before the meeting from say four to five or at the end of the meeting from 6.30 to 7.30. And I wanted to just see if I could get uh, people's input on your availability for that time. Can I see a showing of hands of people who'd like to do it from four to five? And it will be in this location. Can we count how many is that? One, two, three, four. Five, six, okay. Um, 5.30 to 7.30, is there anyone who prefer that? I can do either. One, go. Okay. Um, how about if I send out an email and we can try to get to a consensus and see if we can um, set that up for December. You also um, requested, a few of you have requested a retreat type event, maybe to um, do a little bit more networking with each other and some training. So I'd like to have uh, propose a training in January where we can bring you in for two to three hours on a day that works for everybody and uh, do training on the ADA, uh, training on um, more to talk about what you can do for, to have impact as board members and also have our intergovernmental relations staff come talk with you and they can talk about how exactly what your powers are, what your duties are and ways you can impact things at the state level and uh, locally here in Boston. So I'll send out some um, possible dates and get your feedback on that. So that will be in January. Also, also in January, I'm gonna ask for nominees for board officers. I've mentioned this before, but we're looking for a permanent chair uh, a vice chair, a secretary, and a treasurer. So I'd like everybody to think if you'd like to nominate yourself or nominate someone else. And um, I'll send out a meeting, uh, I'll send out a, an email in early January just to talk a little bit about the responsibilities of each uh, this, position. This is called, just for clarification, you yes. just want us to nominate by January and we'll vote in February? Yeah, the vote will be in February. So think about it. I'll send out, I'll actually send out the duties of each position in December so you can think about it. And I'd also like um, in January to think about creating some subcommittees. So if you'd like to think about topics for subcommittees, like I know architectural access has been an interest. Maybe there'll be uh, someone's interested in like a city council type subcommittee, um, you know, other things, that, ideas that you have, and if you'd like to serve on any of those subcommittees. And we can talk about that in our training with IGR as well. Excellent. Okay, so um, moving on, uh, one other logistical point. The meeting format that we're, we're proposing is to have two speakers per meeting instead of three so that we'll leave time for discussion. We'd like to have a city agency present, similar to what um, we had tonight. And then we'd also like to have a development project presentation. We really wanna get the board's feedback, especially during 
big developments that have open comment periods so that you'll be able to you know, get your comments heard, have them officially in the record, and uh, especially on big projects that impact major areas of Boston. Development movement in like a construction project yeah, or something? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yep. So um, we have ours already set up for the December meeting, so we're looking forward to that. Okay, so then uh, moving on from logistics, I would like to um, emphasize what Carl said about voting. We all know the election's coming up on November 6th. And in your handouts, you have a flyer on early voting. If people aren't familiar with this, the city instituted it two years ago. And uh, early voting started on Tuesday of uh, this week. And it goes through um, the end of October. And you can vote at, there's a listing of dates and locations. They are all accessible. And you can vote at any one of these locations, even if you don't live in the neighborhood. Boston City Hall has early voting most every day up until the election. So you can come here and vote. Um, and please spread the word to other people because often people with disabilities, uh, only having one block of time one day can be a challenge if it's weather related or transportation or health issue. We don't want you to miss the opportunity to vote just because you can't get there on that one day. So please take advantage of this. And if you do run into any barriers in your voting experience, please let us know. We work very closely with the Elections Commission and we give them feedback all the time so they really wanna hear from you if you do run into any barriers. Okay, so another thing that I wanted to update people on was Councillor Flynn has called for a hearing on disability issues. It was a notice that was put out to the public. I don't know if people have seen that yet but he um, wants to just raise our issues uh, to the city council members and talk about things we've done and things we need to work on. So before that happens, we don't have a date yet, but we will, I'll send the notice out to everybody and we can think about things that we would like to have the councilor raise as issues and also think about having people attend to make their voices heard directly to is council members. Is he a members. councilor at large? He is uh, South Boston in Chinatown. Okay, thank yeah. you. I'm not sure the district, I think it's district four. I should know that, it's my district. Um, so that will be happening soon. Um, I think before the end of the year, but we'll definitely let people know about that. And uh, another thing with the city council, I testified last week at a hearing on dockless bikes, along with Olivia, dockless scooters, electric scooters. So the um, Boston Transportation Department and the city council wants to hear feedback from the Disability Commission, the Disability Community, as well as the Commission. So I wanted to leave time in the agenda to just hear your feedback on that. And we'll do that in a few minutes, but I just wanted to throw it out there. So if you do have thoughts and comments, please think of them now while I finish my report. Uh, a few other updates. I have um, the Boston Public Library does have early voting at the Copley branch, but it is not in the new building. It's in the, I mean, I'm sorry, it's not in the old building, it's in the new building, which is fully accessible. So people can go in that way to vote. And I did speak to the facilities manager today at the Boston Public Library, and he's happy to report that the ramp was installed today. So it was completed this afternoon. The only thing that's still in progress is the electric doors, the sliding doors, but they should be finished by the end of the week. So that's really good news, and thanks to David Vieira for uh, keeping on us about, about that. <laughs> I'm sure you'll come up with something. Oh, come on, David. I'll give you an opportunity to speak even though they did it. You'll, never mind. Thank you for your hard work on that. And with that, that is all I have. I know we have um, some other things to get to, so I will turn it uh, back over to Carl. <coughs> Next is the architectural access report from Patricia Mendez. I am not Patricia Mendez. Oh, I am not Patricia Mendez, but I'm filling in for her tonight. I'm Sarah Leung with the Disabilities Commission. Um, I have a few um, updates um, for architectural access projects that we're working on. Um, one of them is Suffolk Downs Development in East Boston and Revere. Um, we've teamed up with Age Friendly Boston as well as the Elderly Commission um, to review their project. Um, it is going to be approximately 
5 million square feet of development on almost 110 acres of land. Um, four acres of that will be publicly accessible open, a publicly, publicly accessible open space system um, and two retail nodes both at Suffolk Down Station and Beachmont and BTA stations. There will be a public meeting um, on Tuesday, October 30th at the Suffolk Downs Clubhouse in the Top Cider Room on the third floor at 525 McKellen Highway um, for this project and Spanish language interpretation will be available as well. Um, secondly, um, Patricia and I, as the architectural access staff on the commission, met with 20 Endicott, um, Endicott College students who are studying interior architecture, and we presented a presentation on universal design principles as it relates to their education in interior design. Um, and we also want to make a focus on educating young professionals um, in the architecture and design <laughs> field about universal design. Thirdly, um, the Boston Planning and Development Agency has a few new planning studies that they're kicking off, and they'd like to uh, invite the disability community to be part of this process. Um, yesterday, there was a JP Rocks Transportation um, Community Charette that was held um, at the English High School. Another one that is happening tomorrow night is Plan Mattapan Open House Kickoff, and that will be um, tomorrow night at 6.30 to 8.30 at Mildred Avenue Community Center located at 5 Mildred Avenue in Mattapan. And another one is Plan Glover's Corner. Um, they're looking at development ideas um, and for future visioning. That will be th Thursday, November 8th at 6 o'clock to 7.30 at the local um, 103 IBU. And that will be located at um, 256 Freeport Street in Dorchester. Um, and then the last public meeting that I'm advertising um, is a um, public information session for the AAB bill, um, which will be held on Thursday, September 8th at 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Um, at the Metro West Transit Authority at um, 15 Baldwin Avenue in Framingham, Mass. Are there any questions? This is Carl. So <clears throat> the AAB B bill, is that the same bill that was in the legislature last year where they're trying to make the architectural access guidelines, the federal guidelines, and the AAB match? I am not sure which bill they're referring to, but we will um, get back in an email okay. confirming that. I think it is. That it, it, it's been I believe so. I just don't want to yeah. say that on record. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Next, Thank you. we have the board discussion on dockless bikes and electric scooters. Thank you, Carl. So as I said a few minutes ago, the city council had a hearing on dockless electric scooters, which are not uh, accepted in Boston yet. We are talking about a potential pilot program. Some other cities around the country have established programs for electric scooters. I know uh, Somerville and Cambridge are talking about it. So the city council held a hearing. They heard a lot of positive things about the scooters from the public and from the electric scooter companies. They heard some concerns uh, from people with disabilities and um, other members of the public, people who are elderly, uh, just with concerns of making sure the sidewalk remains open and accessible. So I spoke up to talk about um, making sure there's a clear path of travel, trying to figure out what type of enforcement the city will be able to do and what type of um, policies that the company is going to have as far as where people can leave the bikes. If people aren't familiar with the program, you can rent an electric scooter on an app and then you can take it to wherever you're going and just basically leave it anywhere. You don't have to dock it to a station. You don't have to dock it to a pole. It can just be left anywhere. So our concern is that they'll be left in the middle of the sidewalk. 
We've seen some of it. We've heard certainly anecdotally about some barriers that the scooters are causing. So again, I testified on behalf of accessibility on the sidewalks and on behalf of the disability community to make sure our concerns were heard. Council of Flynn and Council of Wu were very strong um, supporters of accessibility. In fact, Council of Flynn said that that was gonna be his primary concern as far as electric scooters. Councilor O'Malley had called for the hearing. He's a big proponent of these scooters. And I think people are looking at it really as the last link from a T station to your final destination, not so much as like a whole trip, but you know, they can leave them. I mean, people can use them in any fashion. It's just that I think the city thinks that this will be a good use of them um, to, to get, um, fill that gap. So I wanted to ask Olivia if you'd like to just briefly summarize your comments and concerns and then open up for the board to see if you have any comments I can take back to BTD or to the city council or if you're in favor of it. Anything that you'd like to let me know, please do so. Um, yes, this is Olivia. Uh, the comments I basically made were around, uh, I saw these both, both uh, types of scooter in usage when I went to Denver, Colorado. And I was able to see that people ride them anywhere and everywhere. People very rarely wear a helmet. And I made a comment that that's a way to join our community is to get a head injury. Unfortunately, it's the truth. Um, and as of now, Massachusetts state law requires you to wear a helmet when you operate any type of electric scooter. Um, my understanding is, though, that these scooters would need a carve-out from the current law. Uh, that was a big thing that was made at the meeting. Um, yeah, and that it's another piece of technology that people like myself with mobility disabilities are kind of getting left out of. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have a comment? Leslie? Hi, this is Wesley. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, um, so I just heard a little bit about this, and I was wondering who is going to govern, who can enforce the rules about these things. And if they're being left everywhere, who's picking them up and where they're being stored? So Felicia's question was who is going to oversee the... Um, the bikes that are left on the sidewalks and impeding pedestrians. And that is still to be determined. If we see, if the city sees a great deal of number of scooters left on the sidewalk, it's going to be labor intensive and it will be burdensome to city staff. We don't know exactly how that's going to play out. We don't know the number of scooters that would be left on the sidewalks. and. Um, right now, um, that's done through a combination of ISD, Inspectional Services, and Public Works. They issue what's called green tickets, and those are tickets for things that impede the sidewalk. Like if you put your trash barrels out too soon or don't take them in, or if you have a bicycle that's impeding um, tra sidewalk travel, you get issued a, a citation. So those issues are still to be worked out, Felicia. And I also want to find out from the companies what type of enforcement they're gonna do. Do they go out and pick up the bikes? And do they um, have any sort of fine for their customers who do leave them? Do they have rules where the customers are uh, supposed to leave them? Do they communicate that message? So these are all things that will be worked out in a pilot program. So thank you for raising that. I have it on. It's on now. It's ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow, this is technology. Mm -hmm. So um, this is Wes. I do have a common, I am concerned. People are riding their bikes, the scooters, on the same path of travel as people who are walking. And my concern is that I cannot hear somebody from behind. I would suggest that these companies coming in, it will make it worse. There should be some type of equipment <clears throat> installed that is, has flashing lights. So it will alert individuals who are pedestrians in the area visually to move out of their way instead of auditorily. It's a major concern for people who are deaf. 
Thank you for that comment. We did raise the issue of people with different sensory disabilities, um, people who are blind. I know that even bicycles can be a hazard um, when they ride on sidewalks and in, in intersections and crosswalks. So we definitely will um, make note of that comment and see what sort of safety precautions that the companies can take. This is Carl. <laughs> about the scooter. So um, do you get a lot of um, requests from some patients to bring those scooters in the hospital to use it as a mobility aid? The problem with them is that there's no regulated like um, uh, speed. They can go much faster than some of their power wheelchairs. Um, and Basically, we are very concerned about safety of the patients and the staff at the hospital because we have a lot of different folks with walkers and other mobility aids other than just wheelchairs. So um, I'm just wondering what kind of regulations will they have they thought of putting in place for people who say they need them for disability reasons do they have to document it, or are they just able to use it anywhere at any time? So uh, to answer the question of what about people who say these electric scooters are a mobility device, I know that issue came up when Segways first came out, mm -hmm. and the city has an ordinance on Segways that says they are not allowed um, to be driven on the sidewalks. Uh, an exception was made for people who use them as mobility devices, but they do have to maintain uh, a certain speed limit, and they can only be one at a time. I know maybe some of you have seen the groups of Segway tours where you have five or ten Segways all grouped together. So those are not allowed to be uh, mobility devices in groups like that. They have to be individual um, cases, but there is no um, documentation or anything like that. That being said, there was a lot of discussion at the hearing um, earlier this week about speed. So I know that um, for powered wheelchairs, they're classed as uh, class one, two, or three, and class three is the, the highest tier of a power mobility device, and that has a certain speed limit. I, it's like six or seven miles per hour, I believe. So anything that's um, the electric scooters, I forget. Do you, I don't know if you remember, Olivia, the, the speed range. I can't remember exactly what it is, but they won't be able to go on the sidewalk uh, at their highest speed. And I think that is still a question to be worked out. But if it's anything like the segways, it would be potentially allowed on a sidewalk at a certain speed as a mobility device. But that is, I'm only saying that's what happened with the segways. I don't know what happened with the scooters, but we will definitely make note of that being an issue. Go ahead. Um, this is Olivia. I know Commissioner Fiandaka from Transportation mentioned that um, these would be restricted from the sidewalk. You must use, if the pilot comes out, they must be used in right away uh, and stored on a sidewalk was the, was the plan. Okay. So Olivia, when you, this is Carl, when you say right away, you mean like they have to be in the bike path on the street rather than on the sidewalk? Correct. Well, Olivia, this is Brian again. Um, uh, so you are only meant to use outside but not inside. Is that correct? Sorry. Hello? Can someone repeat that question for Olivia? Zari, can you repeat the question? Yes, um, I said, so I just, I want to make sure I understand this correctly. They're only uh, supposed to be used outside, not inside a building. Is that correct? Correct. Yes? Yes, yes Zari, that's that is correct. correct. Okay, so somebody, if somebody brings in a scooter, inside a hospital area, we can actually tell them they cannot bring it in. Is that right? I think we should talk about that more offline. But one thing that I can say is the BTD is in the process of updating definitions 
of different types of motor vehicles. And I believe they're gonna have a definition of this electric scooter. So we can see what the definition of the electric scooter is, and that may have parameters on where you can use it. So we can definitely follow okay. up offline. Okay, I just wanna make sure there are clear guidelines about it so that we won't have any issues with um, permission. Okay, thank you. Okay, go ahead. Yep. This is Olivia. I think we need to make it clear, these devices are currently banned from usage in Massachusetts. It would require legislation change, a change in the actual state law for this pilot to even be allowed because the, neither the bird scooters nor the lime scooters, which were, uh, or the lift scooters, the, none of them have turn signals, none of them meet the, the, the minimum requirements written as a motor scooter in state law. That is correct, but there are um, ways to get around that uh, for municipalities like home rule petitions where a city can do their own, but it still is a process that we would have to go through. To that, this is Carl, to that effect, what's interesting is I actually threw a person out of the state house today because they were racing around on a scooter that they were showing off to legislators. So they're, whoever is behind this dock like bikes and electric scooters is already at the state house lobbying for the use of the, to be used. Just so the community knows. Ducey has a question. Hmm? Ducey has a question. Go ahead, Ducey. Yes, um, so I'm just listening to this and I have similar concerns as Olivia earlier mentioned. I, I, mean, I, I see a lot of these bicycles and they have these bicycle lanes and the, regarding the scooter, I mean, the thing is my sense is it just does not make sense really to me to have these sco scooters unless it could be used by elderly or people who walk with canes. Like if they, I mean, in the ideal world, quote unquote, it could be, it would make sense to me personally if we had like lanes for so many schools where, um, how should I describe this? Okay, I, I just, okay, I'll, I'll give an example. Like there are some supermarkets like Stop and Shop and others where there are like similar to schools where you have a basket and you can sit on and, and do your groceries and just use that to so temporarily use it as your scooter and then when you don't need your grocery, then you put it back where it was in, in the hallway uh, where they have. So it could it would make sense if they had these similar uh, lanes for scooters, if that's what they're called, <coughs> certain lanes in the city uh, for people with, uh, who walk with canes or crutches or elderly so they, can, uh, so they don't have to walk that much. That would make more sense. Just wanted to put it out there. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. Um, Commissioner, how, um, I know that the, uh, the dockless uh, bike program has been in effect in the city for a little bit of time. What's the feedback been on that so far? And, and you know, we've all seen, or a lot of us have seen uh, on, you know, social media and whatnot, and on the news about the, the, the bikes being, you know, le left, you know, in paths of travel and, and impeding you know, folks with disabilities, uh, access to the sidewalks or other businesses. So what's the feedback on the, on the bikes so far? Dockless bikes are not allowed in Boston. Oh, they're not. We have the Blue Bikes program, which Wait, is the docked bike yeah, rentals. Yeah, how's that, how's that going? That's, that's fine. I mean, they have to be docked. They have to be returned to a dock. Dockless bikes, I believe, are allowed in some um, perimeter communities, maybe Quincy, and I'm not sure about Cambridge and Somerville. But um, some of them have been taken into Boston and left on the sidewalks. Again, it's, it's been an issue. Okay, thank you. Elizabeth has a question. Go ahead. Uh, Elizabeth, um, I just wanted to follow, I, I share the concerns that several commis uh, commission members have voiced about um, impeding the sidewalk. I'm curious about the issue of also given the speeds that they can attain the, that they're not, there's no requirement for helmets. I can see how that f fits in with the model of that it can be dockless and left anywhere. My concern is even, um, I think, 
we've already seen uh, in every category, pedestrians, bicyclists, as well as vehicles, that um, even people who have their respective roles can, uh, can be uh, um, blatantly uh, disrespectful or even doing illegal maneuvers. Um, I'm concerned that even there's a lack of accountability. You can, that, um, that I, on the one hand, they're supposed to be out in the street, but um, where they'd be, you know, adjacent to the vehicular traffic, and yet, you know, in a situation where there's no, uh, no helmets, and also um, you can just leave them, that I, I think it, uh, as a mentality or, or lack of awareness that some people perhaps even aren't, uh, you know, deliberately leaving it in, in a um, place where it's going to be difficult. But the, from a safety point of view, I have concerns on a couple of fronts. So this is all great feedback, and I'd like to suggest that you each email email to me your concerns, and we can put I can put together a document mm -hmm. and share that with BTD and with the city council. One, I agree with that. And one quick thought I had: since this is app based, maybe every time they rent a bike, a notice a notification could pop up. Just don't leave this on the sidewalk. Yep. One other thing I forgot to mention is that. Um, we did raise the possibility of maybe an advisory board or group to talk about the pilot, to work on the pilot, so that we would have some disability representation on that board. Okay. Great. Well, thank you, Commissioner and Olivia, um, for bringing this up. And do you want to do public comment for this? Okay. Yeah. Hold on. Is, is there any feedback from the public pertaining to dockless bikes and electric scooters only? Yes, go ahead, David. If I may. Please go up to the podium. <clears throat> Thank you very much, David Vieira from Hyde Park. Um, what the major issue here is lack of enforcement. I had a meeting with Captain Andres from the Boston Police Department a couple of weeks ago. And we did a one-hour walk around in Copley Square. And I pointed out all the moving violations of manual bikes that were taking place in Copley Square, as well as bikes being chained in inappropriate places and impeding pedestrian traffic, driving on sidewalks, driving the wrong way down one-way streets, driving through intersections where they have red lights, driving through crosswalks where there were active pedestrians. If these dockless scooters come in, we are going to be overwhelmed with the exact same kinds of regulations, with the exact same kinds of, of infractions, rather. And my point to Captain Andres is that there is no visible Boston Police Department enforcement of Chapter 85 of the Massachusetts General Laws, which prohibit all of these things. And I can't see the rationale of allowing these scooters on our streets when those of us who have difficulty getting around anyway are already dodging things that might cause us physical harm. Thank you. Thank you, David. And um, just to follow up, Captain Andres did reach out to me as well, and he told me about your meeting. So I said that I would meet with my staff and with the internal stakeholders in City Hall and then get back to him. Thank you, Commissioner. Sure. Very well said, David. Good. Anybody else? Okay, moving on to new business. Oh, no, old business. Do we have any old business that we have to follow up on? Hearing none, we're moving to new business. I um, brought this up because I, I was looking at some of the other agendas of some of the other CODs online, because I guess I was bored. And um, I noticed that Brookline was um, writing a letter on behalf of 
uh, with suggestions from Colin Killis from um, Disability Policy Consortium saying that they would like to make sure that the next director of the Massachusetts Office on Disability is a person with an obvious disability. As a, um, and so I didn't know if this Commission on the Disability also wanted to sign on to a similar letter, just stating that they hope the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts appoints a director with a disability. Um, this is Jerry Carl. Um, has this been a pro? I mean, has this been something that that's been an issue uh, recently, or no? Um, it's just that right now there is no um, director on mass mm -hmm. on disability, and the current um, person, the acting director of the Massachusetts on Disability, is not a person with a very good guy, nice guy, he's doing a good job, but he's not a person with an obvious disability. And I think they just want to make sure that when the governor finally does get around to appointing someone, it's an obvious person with a disability. Okay, I would think that that might be a slippery slope. Okay. Yeah, um, myself, I mean, we could certainly suggest, but um, but I don't I don't see how we could you know we could say you know something or or kind of or else you know kind of kind of thing, but. You know, that could be a slippery slope, I think. You okay. know, I don't know what other folks have to say. Well, this is a commission decision, so I'm just bringing it up. Any other thoughts? Um, so my thought about that is that obviously the first thing is I would want somebody best qualified for the job, somebody who cares about the community and somebody who's really invested. Um, and that person could be someone who has a family member with a disability. So kind of saying they have to have a disability would limit to that population that might just as much have an investment in the disability. Um, so that's one thing that I would say. But then, but then the second thing I would say is that they could advertise it as, um, you know, that they welcome um, anyone from different backgrounds, specific disabilities, um, somebody who's very culturally sensitive, and uh, with, with, with people with disabilities and uh, aware of issues of disparities. So I, 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 I'm kind of in between about that. Uh, I just think limiting it to visible disabilities is it's, it's another, like you said, it's slippery slope because then you're kind of um, you're kind of cutting out a lot of other people that might be qualified for the job. Okay, thank you, Zari. Olivia has a comment. Go ahead. Yeah, this is Olivia. Um, we've been cut out of enough jobs. Uh, I think that it behooves the state to appoint someone to the. Massachusetts Office on Disability who has a disability. I mean, it just makes sense. Uh, we have too many people speaking for us and on behalf of us. Let's have someone from our community representing us. Go ahead. Yes, here's Ducia. I, well, I actually just want to second what you, Olivia said, and it just makes sense, all sense that whoever gets that position should be obviously disabled and has some extensive experience in past advocacy, I think, because you can't just get that job without just, I mean, being disabled is not, should not be, but there should be requirements. Is there like a list that can be sent that we could forward to other advocates? to see if someone's interested. Thank you. Go ahead. Wesley. Wesley. So if we submit a letter, I don't know if that's enough. Maybe we could also set up um, a petition, a website that people could sign and we can get more signatures from the community in support of that, that we want someone with a disability to be the director? Well, I think that's 
that's something that we have to occur to agree on, don't we? I didn't hear Zari. Can someone repeat it? She said, I think we have to agree that we want to do a letter or something like that. Yeah. Um, we can put this to a vote. Um, what people want to do. Do I hear any motion? Elizabeth. Um, actually, before the motion, I'm, I was just wondering, is there a way to clarify that without explicitly stating you must have, you know, that the, I, I'm totally in support of the idea that the person have lived experience, but is there something that ties into the person's qualifications and expertise? So why don't I do this? Because I don't know 100% what Colin's intent was when he wrote this draft letter. Do you want me to reach out to him, speak to him, summarize it in an email to the whole board, and then get clarification? Can I add one? Yes. Yeah. I just want to add one note. A lot of it could depend on the phrasing. Instead of saying explicitly, the person must have a disability, it could be phrased as the person must be representative, must be representative of our community and have lived experience. So it doesn't sound so harsh and exclusive, but yes. more inclusive. This is Jerry. Um, yeah, we don't want to get into any legal entanglements uh, here, definitely. Um, you know, so I think that's that's a good step, Carol. Uh, you know, f you know, finding, you know, other folks who have supported a letter like this, their intent on this, and also maybe even, you know, taking a look at the. At, there must be a job posting. No. There no. There's no posting for this. This is government appointed. There's no. Po all right. So there's no. There's no guidelines that they. That the government. No, and I think that's of. why. I think that's why. D DPC and some of the other commissions on the disability had some concerns because there wasn't. Well, if, if that's the case, then I definitely think we should uh, do something. But in order to clarify, you know, our position, I think we definitely need to do a little bit of research. Okay. I, I'm okay with calling um, the original author of this letter and getting more clarification and then summarizing it and sending it back to the board if everybody wants to wait before we make a final decision. Yes. Um, well, this is very, just one last question. Are you saying that the person has to have a visible disability? I just want to make sure I understand you. <coughs> no, I'm not sure, but the person has to, I think they said the person, if I, the letter's here, right? Can I add, I did read the letter, and I believe that is what they're saying. They want somebody with a visible disability. Right. And there is something to that. I mean, so that's, that's the discriminatory side. You know, you have people with mental illness, people with the uh, non-apparent disabilities. You're, I mean, I, I would not support that at all because even though I have a physical disability, I would never, ever want to discriminate against another group of community that has a disability. I agree. Oh, I, I just, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by this now. Can I just I add that? I would never advocate for that. There are two sides to so, that So this is Felicia. So, so as a person that lives with an invisible disability, one that is very debilitating almost and life-threatening, not almost, but is life-threatening to me, I, I would think that um, if I walked in for a, a whatever job, and because I didn't look like a person, you know, that had a disability, even though I could tell them everything that happened to me, I would feel very discriminated against. And yeah. if, you know, we, as, a, as a community, we start talking about what it looks like and what, you know, what this one looks like, we're creating a kind of diversity within our own community. And I don't know that we need to do that. I don't think so either. I agree with you. I would say that. Go ahead. Um, I'm looking at the letter right here. This is Jerry, by the way. Um, and it does, uh, from what I'm seeing, it doesn't say specifically that that the person should ha have a visible disability, but it's, oh, but it, sa oh, it says they should have a demonstrated capacity and willingness to speak up for the rights of people with disabilities, 
substantial preference should be given to applicants who have disabilities themselves. Uh, the, the lived experience oh, of, of disability is a crucial... I think I misunderstood. If, if that's all it said, I thought it said like somebody with a physical, visible disability. So, right. That's what I thought yeah. I So what if we remove the word visible and just said someone with a disability? I don't think that is in there. I think I misunderstood. It's not in it's not It in doesn't there. appear to be in there. Okay. Oh, yeah. You should have supported. That's fine. I just did not want to put a division between our communities. Right. Right. Yeah, based on reviewing this letter, I, I could support this, um, this letter now. Can you send a copy of the letter to us? It was in the email that went out on Monday from Jessica. Oh, no, did it? Yes, Carl, it's in the email that was sent out in the board meeting materials on Monday. Okay. Okay, so it's already in our email. All right. So, yeah. Can you have a moment to, can you have time to read it and then vote on it? So how about this? How about if we, after tonight we give everybody an opportunity to read it, I'll send out an email to the group and the group can make a decision um, that way? Elizabeth has a question. Elizabeth has a comment. Go ahead, Olivia. Elizabeth. 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 Quick clarification. No, this is Elizabeth. Um, is this search already actively underway? What is the time frame for when this director, in other words, just so our, our response is timely, I just was so, wondering. I don't know, but what I think is probably happening is since there's an election, people are out running for election, the governor does not want to make any agency head appointment until after the election is over mm -hmm. and some of the secretariat positions are filled. And so my guess is, <clears throat> Sometime after the election, but I'm not sure how. Not it's not like tomorrow, but it, and but it's probably sometime after the election. Okay, and one other um, is that I know sometimes for uh, um, for positions um, there is an interview committee or something. I don't know how this works for a government. It doesn't situation. sound like it. I'm sorry. No, could, it doesn't sound. It, could, it's a government appointment. Is that? It's a, it's a governor appointed, so yeah, okay. I mean they can post it if they want to, but they don't have to. They can okay. just, the governor or probably the secretary of administration and finance would just, um, I'm assuming they're going to interview candidates, and I'm assuming they're going to talk to some folks, but they can appoint whoever they want with, without going through proper channels. This person serves at the pleasure of the governor. I shouldn't say proper channel, without going through um, typical HR processes. Okay. Thanks for the. So, do you need a motion? Do I need a motion? Uh, does anybody want to give me a motion? No. What? Is the motion for the letter? Yes. I'll, I'll move, um, as Carol said, um, what, he's, what he's hoping to do is, is give us some time to read the letter and then solicit our, our, our feedback via email. You sure? I, I, move, um, I move to, for the board to further explore whether to support um, a letter um, a letter, you know, of concern or, or advocacy letter for uh, the position of MO, MOD director. Um, I second it. All in favor, <laughs> signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Okay, I carry it. So over the next few days, we can read the letter that Jessica sent out, and then I can call Colin and see what the original intent of the letter was, and then we will um, put it to a vote online with all of us together, and then um, go from there. Thank you. Uh, Carl, can you let us know after your conversation what that daughter of the letter 
States. Yeah, that's as my their intent. intention. Absolutely. Thank you, Carl. Okay, next we have other new business. Who? Other new business. Anybody have any other comments? Is that what you're saying? New said? business. Other new business, yeah. I have another new business item. Uh, I forgot to mention that we are tentatively planning our civic engagement day for December 12th, the day of the next board meeting. <laughs> and that's a day when we bring um, people from the public in to meet their city councilors, hopefully meet the mayor, and attend the board meeting if they're able to. We'll update you on that. Commissioner, and this is Jerry. What would be the time frame of that? Because that, that impacts you know, part of the, our meeting as well. What you've said about the, uh, the 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 retreat, the, not the retreat, but the social aspect of yeah, we usually do in the afternoon, probably two to four. Okay. And board members wouldn't have to be here, but if you could come early too, that would be great. Sure. Any other new action items before we move on to public input? Can I can yes. I just ask a question of the commissioner? Mm -hmm. um, I f forgot to ask this earlier, and I apologize. Around the early voting for the um, for the city, uh, I noticed that it's not in every neighborhood. Uh, is there is there a reason why that 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 uh, that it isn't in every neighborhood? And is there plans to in the future maybe expand expand it? Is there a neighborhood that's missing that you noticed? I thought I thought Roslindale was missing. Um, I haven't reviewed it. I I thought that they were doing it in every neighborhood, but um, I can follow up if it isn't. Sure. Any other new business items before we move on to public input? Elizabeth has something. Elizabeth. Uh, I just wanted to, um, this is Elizabeth, I just wanted to find out um, for, so uh, uh, from what you were saying, uh, Commissioner, that um, if we'll have two presentations a month, one would be from a government agency, and one, what, uh, what was the second category? Development. Development, thank you. Um, so would there be some way uh, for us to know how many months out then um, it looks like certain speakers would, would be um, projected? I know sometimes things can come up where if something is compelling or if someone can't give a presentation, there need to be changes. But um, for instance, when we had talked about someone uh, to come and speak to the commission about transportation issues to have some sense of when in the new year, what months, how far out that might be projecting. Yeah, we can talk about that. Um, okay. We're open to suggestions. And certainly welcome input from board members on suggestions for presentations. So, the, but I'm not just uh, suggestions, but um, uh, we would just offline then sp uh, speak to you about, you know, oh, well, this month is already, you know, sure. we already have speakers lined up through March of 19 or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, any other new action items uh, before we move on to public input? All right, hearing none, let, does anybody from the public have um, anything they wish to uh, bring to the board's attention? If so, please make your way up to the podium. Hi everyone, thank you for inviting us up here. My name is Nina and this is my neighbor Tanya and we live in the Seaport area. And we'd like to tell you a quick story. Uh, we know that the game is about to start so we'll try to be quick. Um, on April 8th, 2018, a pit bull named Honey attacked my nine-year-old yellow Labrador causing si serious injury to my dog. My dog never attempted to defend himself. The owner of the pit bull claims that his dog is an emotional support dog. The attack was so aggressive, and while my dog was in emergency surgery, uh, I filed an emergency dangerous dog hearing with animal control. 
I soon learned that my dog was the fourth dog attacked by this emotional support dog. While waiting for animal control's uh, emergency dog hearing, tragically, the emotional support dog attacked again, but this time it was a guide dog. The guide dog was crossing Newberry Street and Clarendon Street in the back bay, and the blind owner was nine months pregnant, and she was pushing her two-year-old in a stroller. Uh, clearly something must be done. This is not an emotional support dog. It's uh, causing emotional stress to society. And yet this owner of the emotional support dog thinks he has more rights than the guide dog and her family. So that's why we're here. Um, this coming Monday on October 29th at 9 o'clock at, at 24 New Cheriton Street, Animal Control will hold yet another hearing about this tragic case. Again, the owner is still petitioning the findings that the, his dog is a dangerous dog and needs to be humanely euthanized. I invite anyone, we would invite anyone, um, who is here in the room, friends of friends, anyone uh, who would like to come and attend the, uh, this hearing, show your support for uh, the guide dog family um, and help us explain what this irresponsible dog owner did to not just this guide dog family, but to the whole community and his fraudulent excuse of claiming that his dog is serving some form of service, because he's certainly not. So I would like to invite everyone that are politicians, citizens, friends, family, anyone to come together and collaboratively re look at these laws and definitions so people cannot just force their way into living in situations where there's certain dog breeds that are banned for certain reasons. Some are wonderful, but some are not. And people are misusing these little loopholes, and it really pisses me off. And knowing what it's doing to people's lives and this family that's been shattered by this irresponsible dog owner is just cruel and inhumane and needs to change. So, um, it's a rare opportunity that you have such <coughs> extreme cases. And if anyone really wants to make a change, this is probably the biggest case that I can think of where a phony baloney did something tragic. And we would like help on changing that. So again, if anyone would like to come to the hearing on Monday, we would love your support. Olivia, you sound like a firecracker. Um, and um, really come together and try to figure out how we can collaborati co collaboratively, collectively, and effectively support the rights for those that really truly need their service animals to navigate through their world. So thank you. Any questions? So Nina and, and Tanya, is that right? Yes. The two, these two ladies actually came to my office earlier in the week and brought this to my attention. They've also visited the Mass Commission for the Blind, the Mass Office on Disability, and have met with the new commissioner. Um, and the reason why is because this blind woman has lost her mobility device. She can no longer use her dog. Um, the I, dog. I, I believe that's the case. We don't have, I know the dog is recovering. I don't know if she's able to Well, right now that. she can't. Yeah. So she's not leaving the house right now. Um, the dog may go back to work. I will tell you more often than not, they don't. I had a dog that was once attacked mm -hmm. by a pit bull outside this dockyard restaurant. So I'll be honest, this is a bit of a sensitive subject with me. Mm -hmm. um, and it took my dog months and months and months before I could convince him. And he wasn't even that badly hurt. He was more traumatized than anything else. I had to work with him for three to six months before I could get Kinley to work again. Mm -hmm. um, the, I spoke to Animal Control, the Boston's Animal Control today, and the woman, um, 
showed me the videos today. They were horrific. Um, and she, so I'm telling you, I, and I'm not necessarily asking this commission to do anything, I just wanted to bring it to everybody's attention. I, as president of the Guide Dog Users Group of Massachusetts, have now decided I will be attending that hearing on Monday in support of Boston Animal Control. Um, and I didn't know if this commission, and this is up to the commission, maybe wanted to write a letter just supporting Boston Animal Control in their decision. Um, because it bothers me that even if you do, you have a lot of rights as a service animal user. I get to take my dog everywhere. I, but I don't get the right to have my dog be out of control. My dog can be confiscated. I still have to vaccinate my dog. I still have to make sure he doesn't attack other dogs. I would hope that if my dog attacked another dog, my dog would be confiscated. Um, um, because, you know, we're in public places, the dogs have to behave. Um, so I, I just wanted to bring this to everybody's attention. I don't know what I wanted to happen tonight, but I just wanted to bring this to everybody's attention. Thank you so much, and thank you for being a hero to floss the guide dog. As we all know, you could have an emotional rat, uh, but that rat's not gonna help you get across the street. We need to protect the rights to allow people the mobility to get around. And this guy just doesn't get it. But let's take this opportunity and teach other people what they're, it's not just, hey, let's get into this, get into this apartment building or let's, let's whatever. This is serious and, and it's devastated this family. So thank you, Carl, and anyone else who's willing to join in. We love the attention and help. Thank you. So I just had a question. Go ahead. Um, just for clarification, so what is the hearing on Monday? What's the purpose of the hearing on Monday, I guess? Well, uh, the hearing has uh, already happened on the 10th of August, uh, August and the dog was deemed uh, to be a dangerous dog. The owner insisted it get it reevaluated evaluated for the third time, this time to Tufts. Meanwhile, this is all on the taxpayer dime. Um, the dog has been housed, um, quarantined, um, and had to be transported to and from Tufts, uh, so over in Grafton or whatever, um, and then evaluated. And uh, I was just there for my dog's services. Um, and that's a $500 valuation. How many times do we have to have this dog evaluated? How many attacks do we need to have happen? My dog's attack was also on videotape and it was not provoked. Floss, the guide dog, she was crossing the street, never even saw the dog coming. She was not provoked. Um, just so anyway, the, the dog owner is appealing the ruling and he obviously loves his dog, but my, my dog lost part of his hearing. My dog's injured. Floss might be retired. It just, it's heartbreaking. So yes, it's important because he's claiming he has rights and he has emotional support needs as well. It's at nine o'clock on Monday. And again, the address is 24 New Chardon Street, right down the street from here. At the courthouse. At the courthouse. Um, and I think it's on the fifth floor, but uh, I don't know yet. I'll find out on Monday. It's at the book courthouse. Uh, it's at the book courthouse. Yes, yes. Go ahead, Olivia. Um, I am very angry to hear about this. This is not acceptable. And I'm glad Animal Control has said, no, this dog is dangerous. Um, I was a service dog handler until mine retired and passed. And um, I'll be there because, quite frankly, that's untenable. I can't imagine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya and Nina, for bringing this to our attention. Thank you, everyone. We really appreciate it. I'm sure the, the family does, too. I, I'm trying to keep their name out in case they want to keep their somewhat privacy and anonymity, but um, they're very traumatized, as you can imagine. So thank you very much for everyone's help. Thank, thank you. you. Any other public input? 
Hearing none, do I hear any other motion to perhaps adjourn so we can go watch the Red Sox? We've got one tomorrow. I move to adjourn. No, we've got, we've got someone. Oh, oh we got someone who wants Sorry. to talk. Okay, go ahead. Make your, please make your way up to the podium. Um, thank you for having me. This is for everyone, too, so uh, I'll turn a tiny bit. Um, my name's Ethan Linsky. I work for a program called EPIC, Empowering People for Inclusive Communities. Uh, what we do at EPIC is just provide opportunities and uh, spaces for young people with disabilities to become active um, and engaged leaders in their communities for the future and for whatever goals that they choose to pursue. Uh, every year we have a fundraiser slash service day called Boston Surf. It's coming up in two Saturdays, November 3rd, and we are always open to um, looking for new volunteers who are interested. I have information and flyers if um, this does entice you. Um, and we would really appreciate the support. It's an awesome day. We'll be at the Madison Park uh, Technical Vocational High School doing totally revamping and repainting the fourth floor, the entire fourth floor. There's generally 200 young people, and this will all be led by our service warriors, the young people who engage in our work, who are going through our signature program that then lead teams of 10 to 20 volunteers. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? All right. Do I hear any motions to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Any second? I motion. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? All right, go Boston Red Sox. We'll see you at our next meeting in November. Thank you very December. much. December. Good night.